I'd love for you to join me May 19th at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, where we're going to answer your questions live on how to rock retirement in this age of inflation and everything else going on, as well as talk about the open enrollment period for the Rock Retirement Club. You can learn more and register at livewithroger.com. I looked the other day and the stock market is in correction territory, down over 10%. Interest rates are rising. Inflation is at decades high levels. It is really hard to have the confidence to rock retirement. Hey, Roger Whitney here. Welcome to the Retirement Answer Man show. The show dedicated to, well, giving you the confidence to rock retirement. And it can be really hard right now with so much, quote unquote, uncertainty. Uncertainty, I think, is an overused word. But when we have rising interest rates, rising inflation, at least on the short term, stock markets going down and a lot more volatile, it's scary. We don't do well with scary when we're retired or with uncertainty. We don't do well with that. And we see all of these things and we're not sure because we can't see around the corner as to what the future holds, whether all of these things are a blip or constant or a prelude to even greater levels of all of these things. That's the problem. We can't see around that corner. And that's not very comfortable. What I have found in my experience in ter- personally, but also walking this journey with so many folks, is that the first idea is to get more data so we can figure out the future. That is essentially what traditional financial advisors value proposition is. We'll have all these economists and strategists and do all this research. And there is value to that research in flushing out the dynamics of history and looking for ideas of what might be causal to something else. There is some value in that, but I think we put way too much value on that. And we try to find someone that we like and like the way they think and just say, they have it figured out. I'm following that guy or that gal. That's human nature, I think, in a way. And there's some value in that, I guess, but I think it's overrated. It's overvalued. And I think it gives a false sense of security rather than just realizing it is the human condition that we can't predict the future. And there's just a lot we don't know, whether it's with markets or in the inflation or the or withdrawal rates, or there's just a lot we don't know of what the future holds for us personally, the things that we're going to value over time or want to do and how our life will be organized. I mean, we have some consistency. Values and virtues tend to be constant over time as guiding lights, but we're never going to have it all figured out personally and be solved as a human individually, just like we're never going to have it totally figured out when it comes to retirement. The framework, the the image I heard recently that I've really, really noodled on is we think that there's some distant shore that we can reach in our knowledge about interest rates, the economy, our life to where we have it figured out. We think that there's some shore we can reach and we keep striving to reach that shore when really you can't. A better approach would be to think of guiding lights, things to establish some guiding lights to guide your decision-making to really a destination you're never going to reach. And that's what a virtue is or what a value is personally. And in financial planning, that's what assumptions are. We know all assumptions are incorrect. And at times they're going to look really silly, either the assumption's too high or the assumption's too low. But The assumption is the guiding light that we use to help organize things. And we don't want to mess with those too much. And we want to be agile and put in protocols, which are essentially things we do on a consistent basis to iterate and make incremental progress in our life, regardless of the conditions. 
I think that's really important. That's what we're left with. And that's what we focus on. That's how I have confidence in my life. I don't know what's going to happen in the business. I don't know what's going to happen with my clients financially or personally. But if we can have these protocols and have these little conversations and always look for little adjustments along the way, that will help give us agency to manage through a journey where we're never actually going to reach the shore. But that still is uncomfortable. I'm always uncomfortable with stuff like this. I get it. And so just some perspective on what I'm thinking about through conversations I've been having. Now, a couple announcements after this little rant for five minutes that I didn't expect to do. One is we have an upcoming, we call it a webinar, we call it a meetup on May 19th. That's a Thursday at 7 p.m. Central. It's a Thursday. You can go to livewithroger.com to register. And what we're going to do during that meetup, I think we got 150 or so registered right now. We're going to have an open discussion about some of this inflation, the markets, all this stuff going on right now. I think it'll be healthy to have a discussion about it, but also I want to provide a very basic framework, a protocol that you can use to just think through things logically so we don't get too far behind or over our skis in whatever area. So we're going to have an active discussion about this, and I'm going to try to give you a framework that you can take action on to keep you centered as a guiding light. And then we're going to talk about the Rock Retirement Club, which is a club that has a masterclass to help you create your plan of record with the hope that you have a better framework to answer those core questions. Can I retire? How much can I spend? And manage through this uncertainty. So we're going to talk about the course. We'll talk about the club. We'll talk about the activities we have in the club. And the other part, I'm thinking about it because we're doing a lot of the planning on it. In October, I think the 7th through the 9th, that weekend, whatever that is, as if for members of the Rock Retirement Club, we actually have a conference that we hold called the Roundup, and it's going to be in Grapevine, Texas, right by the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, where last year we had 100. We already have 100 registered this year. We're likely going to have, I would say, at least 200 people attending, where we do a full day and a half of education and workshops and connections so we can help people create progress on their journey. And we're right now we're announcing the speakers. Wade Fowle is going to speak at the conference. And it's a free benefit if you're a member of the Rock Retirement Club. In fact, it's only available to RRC members. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But I would encourage you if you're interested in either attending that event or having a like-minded, good-spirited group of people where you can get that world-class education, come check it out at livewithroger.com. And if you can't attend, just go ahead and register because we're going to send out a replay. So didn't mean to be a plug, but it's what we're working on right now. And we're really excited about it. Um, with that, what we're going to do today is continue our discussion on functional health with Dr. Bobby Dubois. We're going to talk about exercise and how we should think about exercise and maintaining the body, the vehicle that we have as we age. And then we're going to answer some of your listener questions. This show is sponsored by LTCI Partners. They are an independent insurance agency that focuses on helping people solve and manage long-term care risk. If you go to ltcipartners.com forward slash R-A-M and click on get quotes, a cool thing will happen. You'll fill out a quick questionnaire that will be a pre-qualification to see if you are even eligible to qualify for long-term care. And then assuming you are, which is important to know, they will send you some example quotes on long-term care policy so you can start to gather some information so you can manage this risk, all without any obligation or any big sales cycle of getting hounded forever. So you go to ltcipartners.com forward slash R-A-M and click on get quotes so you can begin your journey to figuring out how you're going to manage long-term care risk in retirement. All right, we're going to continue this series with functional health with Dr. Bobby Dubose. He is a member of the Rock Retirement Club and offered this. Actually, he came up to me at the last rodeo roundup that we had for the club, and we talked about this subject. I'm excited about his passion, and I'm really excited about his perspective as a medical doctor, as a researcher, and I'm so thankful that he was willing to 
share this journey with us. So let's go chat with Bobby. All right, we're back for our second session on functional health with Dr. Bobby Dubois. Bobby, you sent me an email explaining how to pronunciate your name. And after the last session, my chief grammarian, Nicole Rockstar Mills, and I were actually having a discussion. How does he pronounce his name? And I, we should have just asked you. We were getting Google to you know YouTube and getting how people pronounce it. So I appreciate you sending me an email. Do you get that a lot? Absolutely. Most people like to give it the French pronunciation, Dubois. And we have people regularly come up and tell us we are mispronouncing our own name. <laughs> but there is a long lineage of Du Bois, the gentleman that started the NAACP, W.E.B. Du Bois, pronounced it Du Bois. But no, we have no French ancestry, uh, Russian, Polish, Jewish, Du Bovey, then Ellis Island became Du Bois. And so here we are. Here we are. I appreciate you emailing me. And it's instructive that for some reason, people don't want to just ask. They want to try to figure it out that I should have just asked you. So I appreciate you hearing me and correcting me. So today we're going to talk about exercise and physical health. And the next week we're going to get into nutrition. So let's reframe this again. We talked about using a framework of planning. Why is exercise important as we walk this journey into retirement? Well, it's really the third leg of a three-legged stool. And as everyone knows, you take away one of the legs, the whole thing kind of falls apart. You want to have the financial wherewithal. You know, what do I want to do? I want to get that RV and I want to travel and I want to be able to give some gifts to my kids and this, that, and the other. So you got to have the financial wherewithal. You got to wake up in the morning and say, okay, now I'm retired. What am I going to do with myself? And is it going to be fully satisfying? But the third leg of that stool is I got to have the physical wherewithal. I may have the money. I may know what I'd like to do, but I may be in such chronic pain or muscle weakness, or I just don't have the strength to do all the things I want to do. And boy, that would not rock retirement if you couldn't do that. And so we really, really, really want to help people begin to think about that. So it doesn't kind of come up and bite them in the behind at some point in the future. And exercise has to do with the body. And the body goes through changes. And you hit on this a little bit last week, but what changes does the body go through as we age physically? Well, you know, there's a general deterioration in all different parts of your body. And that's sort of a topic of another day. Your blood vessels do tend to harden and narrow in some parts of the body. The bones get kind of worn out. All different parts of your body take a beating from the standpoint of exercise. And we can get into this more later, but unlike putting money in the bank, well, not the bank, bank doesn't, you don't get much return. On that. <laughs> we maybe now you do. Money, yeah, yeah, better, better now. In the stock market, it grows over time. So you may not have to have all those dollars in the bank today because hopefully it'll grow. And those dollars can then help you enjoy your spending later on. The problem is on the physical side is that your muscle mass deteriorates. Whether you're a woman or a man, after the age of about 30, you lose one to 2% of muscle mass per year. And it probably accelerates as you get to be our age and beyond. So you're fighting a battle that you're losing every day you wake up. I mean, it's a little bit depressing. That does sound depressing when you say it that way. But it's a reality that everybody knows that there's these 90-year-old people and they look frail. And we don't want to be one of those. So we want to get ahead of the curve. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So if we do lose a little muscle mass, we'll be fine. And so the idea, like I think of myself as a 55-year-old today, I've been physically active my entire life. Internally, I have a great base of physical health. That doesn't mean that I, okay, I've built this base and it's going to pay dividends forever, to use your investment analogy, because if I'm at 55, this acceleration increases. And if I just say, well, I've done enough and I can just coast now, it's actually not the case. Well, I think that's exactly right. On the cognitive side, which is unrelated to exercise or our main topic here, studies have shown, you know, people are like, oh, I think I should do crossword puzzles or Sodico or any of those things. So that'll keep my mind good as things happen. What they found is that people who have kind of higher cognitive function as they age do better, in part because they got more to lose. You know, if you're a pretty sharp person, 
and you have some mental deterioration as we all will do, you know, you got more to lose. And so it won't be as evident in your daily life that you're struggling with words and you're struggling to sort through a certain concepts in the same fashion, Roger, you've invested in health and your muscle mass and such, and that will pay dividends. So to the extent that you start aging with more muscle strength and more balance and more aerobic fitness, you'll do better. So all the years of your efforts are good and will help, but it's not enough as we'll need to talk through, which is there's no such thing as generically, I'm in good shape. And therefore, I will age gracefully. That concept works, as we talked about last week, as an 18-year-old. Um, it does not work as a 55 or 65 or 75-year-old. I think very much like planning, this is a concept that I've really been embracing over the last quarter or so, is it's easy to think of things like a distant shore that you can achieve and reach. And that's a fallacy. It's, I think it's one of the struggles that we have just as humans is We think we can figure life out. And in reality, you can't. It's the process of just looking at, say, exercise as a guiding light to help lead us that it's going to be a practice that we always do, not something that we can solve and automatically have figured out. I think that if we conflate those two, it can lead to frustration because we're always frustrated that we're not there yet, right? This is something we're going to do for the rest of our lives. Exactly. You know, when you're young and you exercise, the reason you're exercising is you want to look good. I want to lose weight. I want to do that 5K and not have to walk the, 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 the last part of it. It's very kind of experiential. As we think about it, as we age, it has a different element, which is I want to maintain things that I want to do later on. I was chatting with my wife and asking her about what are the things that people ought to envision as they get older that they want to be able to do. And it was interesting that, you know, everybody thinks, oh, I want to continue to play golf or I want to be able to hike up that somewhat rocky mountain. And, you know, those are all great things. And she pointed out that one of the things that might people might think about is being in an airport and someone, someone jostles you, they accidentally bump into you sideways. Think of about an older person. They could fall over pretty easily. So we want to be protected against that type of bump. And you have to think about, well, what does that entail? And how do I be resilient for that kind of thing? So it's just taking a proactive stance of thinking about exercise in a little bit different way. Our goals at this point is not necessarily to lose weight. It's to maintain function. That's a hard paradigm to shift of identity. I'll use myself as an example because it's an easy example to think of. I'm going to Colorado. We talked about the bike ride. A lot of my motivation health exercise wise is to prepare myself for the mountain biking experiences that I want to create, right? That's just how I've always thought of it. Sort of what you're saying is we think of it as an experiential thing of to go hike and to do these Ironmans and all this other stuff when really I shouldn't not do that, but I should include the fact that, hey, I'm going to be walking on uneven ground when I hike in the woods, and I'm going to have to have work on my balance and my flexibility so I don't trip on that rock as easily and hurt myself. Would you say it's an either or, or you just got to start to think about these things that we probably haven't thought about of in from a practical sense because we just naturally had it as a youthful person? I'm a kind of start with the end in mind kind of guy. I think you're absolutely right, Roger. We tend to think kids think they will be that they're invulnerable and that invulnerability will last their entire lives. And then as they get older and they fall, it's like, oh, God, I sprained my ankle. It's been weeks. Still doesn't feel quite right. And all of a sudden start to realize the body does change. And we don't want to think about the fact that we're going to be old. But we kind of have to. And as you say, it's not either or. I think you just need to uh, spend a little bit of time beginning to think about where do you want to be in 10 or 20 years? Folks might sort of do a thought experiment. I'll do a little aside. We were chatting earlier, Roger, about kind of embarrassing aspects of our personal lives and bringing them out into the public sphere when we talk. So be, be careful now, Bobby. Uh, Don't get yeah, yourself in yeah, trouble. It's, it's too late for my for me. My ba- lack of boundaries is a problem. So 
I've been re watching Cobra Kai, which is the mm -hmm. sequel TV series to Karate Kid. And I suspect many of the people on this podcast watch the Karate Kid or maybe it's- As an aside, movie. I was totally infatuated with Elizabeth Shue when I was a teenager. She was- Love it. Yeah. Love it. Anyway. So in the TV series, they're revisiting some of the, the, the key scenes. And everybody remembers the wax on, wax off, painting the fence- you know, and poor Daniel LaRusso doesn't have any clue. Why is he waxing these cars and he's getting frustrated? And then Mr. Miyagi then starts to go through some attack moves. And all of a sudden, the muscle memory is there to do these things. Like he didn't have the muscle strength before, but now from waxing these cars or doing the fence, he all of a sudden could do certain things. So here's the thought experiment or the, the actual experiment. When we think about certain activities. So if somebody jostles you in a, an airport, what muscles are going to help protect you? So imagine you are looking at a sort of the cartoon character of a person and they're all muscles. You're looking at what parts of their body are activating. So think about golf. All right. So the arms are doing something on the backswing and they're doing something different on the follow through. Now another person is walking up a hill and you can see the muscles on the sides of their legs doing whatever they're doing. Now somebody is trying to stoop down and pick up their grandson and you can sort of see their quads firing and their hamstrings firing or somebody jostles them and all of a sudden now they're sliding sideways and now the side of their leg has to fire. These are all completely different muscle groups. And if you think you're ready for all of these things, great. But here's a not a thought experiment, a real one. Stand up and raise up one of your legs a couple of inches off the ground. All right, I'm going to do this right now. Can we, can we do this? Yeah, that's probably not that hard. Step two, raise that leg up like you're a flamingo. So now it's higher off the ground. Okay, now this is getting harder. Third, close your eyes. Now it's getting really hard. I'm about to fall over. And then the fourth, don't close your eyes on this one, stoop down on one leg and push yourself back up again. And I suspect what people will find is some of these are pretty easy and some of these are getting to be really challenging. So if you get jostled sideways, that's exactly the muscles you want to be firing and strong. So some years ago, I started doing that simple stand on one leg and, and do a squat. And today I feel like I can withstand it more. The problem is we are linear characters. We walk straight ahead. We bike straight ahead. Try yeah. shuffling sideways for a while. And that's not so easy. Get yourself on a basketball court where you got to do a lot of shuffling back and forth. That's a whole different set of muscles. You made this and point you know, briefly the, last week, and that makes total sense. Even rowing and a lot of things we do are forward and back, not side to side or diagonal. The discipline, I think, now is like you're journaling about what are your financial needs and what do you want to do when you retire. Envision what you want to be doing physically. Are you a hiker? And what do hikes look like as you get older? Do you have grandchildren or want to have grandchildren? And what kinds of things do you want to do with them? And then going on an airplane and taking that carry-on bag and not having to ask somebody to lift it up over your head to the overhead bit. All of these are different. They have different muscles. And it's not that hard to think about what kind of exercises might I do to get us that functionality for later on. Well, let's talk about exercise. And we tend to think, and, and the term I've heard you tell me privately is like, one we think in one size fits all, right? I ride my Peloton for 30 minutes a day, or I go for a walk with a dog for an hour. I go to and work on the circuit at the gym of all the machines. That's how I would assume better than nothing, but it doesn't quite fit what we're talking about here. It sounds like. Well, okay. So the one size fits all, you know, there's a reason why one size fits all. It actually does fit some people. And that's where the adage, it can fit all eating too much at every meal. Yeah. Probably not a good idea. That's a one size fits all. The Peloton three times a week, the brisk walking that we're taught to do, that's great if your focus is on length of life. 
So there is a direct relationship between exercise and um, length of life. And it's mediated through weight loss. The more you exercise, to some extent, you will keep your weight under control. It helps your blood pressure. It helps reduce your cholesterol. Generic exercise, pick anything that gets your heart rate going. That will burn calories and that will help you with length of life. Because I think of myself with like my blood pressure and my resting heart rate, right? Yep. They're all very low because of all of this aerobic stuff that I've done. Like right now, I just check my pulse on my whoop and I'm like at 54 Yep, is my heart rate, which is really low for moving around and doing stuff. And so by elevating your heart, you're building that muscle a lot, I guess is the best way to say it, right? Strengthening. You're building that muscle, you're burning calories, you're doing the things that will help your cardiovascular system. And that's the number one cause of death. So for length of life, generic, get on the Peloton, do whatever you want, play pickleball, all wonderful things. But if it's physical functioning and rocking retirement, being able to go on that RV vacation and take the darn barbecue out of the back of your RV (laughs) and setting it up and then realizing, oh, I need some rocks to stabilize it and having to go pick up the darn rocks and bring them over. That's not length of life. That's the functioning and the quality of that experience. That takes a little bit of thought. Now, you said a strength circuit on the machines. I did that on purpose because I have an opinion about that, but I figured you had a thought on that. As long as it's a well thought out circuit, that's a great thing to do. I have a TRX machine, which is that thing that hangs in most gyms, the yellow thing. But if you do one exercise on it, that's great. But to really keep all the muscles in order, you need to do a whole series of things that are, hey, you thought through. And so the generic circuit may be okay, or it may not be okay. If you want to really be able to raise up your grandchild and pick him up in in your arms, then a kettlebell squat is a great thing to do. What the heck is a kettlebell? Well, you know, it's a weight, a newfangled weight. It's not a dumbbell that everybody knows. It's kind of looks like a kettle and you can charge more money and sell you more equipment. So now people do that instead of a a dumbbell, but a dumbbell does the same thing. It's basically a weight, stick it in your arms and then squat. And that's exactly like picking up your grandchild. And if you don't do something like that, it gets harder and harder to do that. And this is the strength side of exercise. So we've talked a little bit about the aerobic side and a little bit about the strength, but there are two more pieces of the puzzle we got to get to. One is balance. The last one is anaerobic. Uh, exercise. And we can come back to those. We can continue on. I was thinking you were going to say flexibility. Do you reel that into balance? I do. Okay. I do. Flexibility is really important because it's real easy to pull a muscle and flexibility will help prevent that from happening. So stretching and yoga and all those wonderful things, I think are a good part of maintaining your function. Would you agree that as you're building out, and we're not going to be able to help everybody solve this today, but I think you're bringing up a lot of issues that help will change our view on how we approach this. A lot of this too, and this is the compounding of it, I would imagine is by creating and being thoughtful about, and we're going to get to these other two tiers, it's going to help avoid injuries because as you get older and you have an injury, That can easily lead to, because we don't recover as quickly, physiologically, we're going to spiral down to not doing anything ever again, or a lot less. And that's a big danger, I would think, as we get older. So the more we can prevent injury, the more we can avoid that possible cascade down. Uh, You're absolutely right. And it's a bit of preventive care. When I was in my 20s in medical school, and I looked around and looked at people and like, you know, I don't have the time to be doing exercise on all parts of my body. And so I was strategic about it. I said, well, what makes a person look out of shape when they're 40? Well, their arms look saggy and their tummy is sticking out. So it's like, I don't have all the time in the world. So I'm going to do biceps exercises and stomach work. (laughs) And when I was 23 or four, whatever it was, I started focusing there. And that was a very cosmetic kind of very short-sighted thing to do, but I did it. And it's really, we're saying the same thing now. As you look forward, what are the muscles that you want to be able to do things around? Now you might say, well, I have no clue what I'm going to do in 10 years. Then I would say, 
I look at the things I've just mentioned and work with those. Picking up your grandchild. Okay, what does it take to take a bag of heavy groceries, walk upstairs into your kitchen and raise that bag of groceries up onto a counter? Well, let's just take the raising the bag of groceries onto the counter. Well, that's both of your arms going forwards. Well, I invite you to go to the gym or go into your kitchen and find some heavy things and put something in your arms and raise it up. Now, and not raise it up over your head, raise it out forward, which is what you're doing. You're taking right. groceries, you're lifting up. That's not so easy. Even when you're whatever your age you are now. And I mentioned this last week when I had, was doing some painting. And after five minutes, I was exhausted. It was just a different set of muscles. And so I'm not saying throw out your old exercise routine, but just pause. Say, what are some of the things I'd like to do? And instead of doing another set of exercises on my biceps, because that's important. Now I'm going to do forward arm raises because that'll help me with groceries. One that came to mind is like people do lunges, right? They step forward and beautiful. But if you're doing forward lunges, that lateral, do a sideways lunge. Right? Do a backwards lunge. Do a back, to sort of mix it up a little bit, right? Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not trying to ruin your life here. I'm <laughs> just trying to have you be strategic. Look, you don't just say, I'm retiring in 20 years. Eh, I probably have enough money. Let's call it a day. And now I'm retired. I got this money. I'm just going to stick it in whatever investment vehicle seems right. No, you diversify your assets. You put them in buckets. You've got pie cake. You have thought in this. Just do the same thing. With diversify your you physical routine. Exactly. I like that. I like that. So make sure we hit on balance and flexibility. Because outside of making sure you maintain muscle mass, I think this is what I, my understanding is. This is a critical one exercise we did earlier about standing on one leg is just one piece of the puzzle. There's a whole series of muscles that help stabilize your body. Some of them are in your hips. So standing on your leg and doing squats will really emphasize parts of your glutes and those kinds of things. That's really important. But there's also your core, you know, and the problem is people think of their core and they think of their stomach. It's like, oh, I mm -hmm. guess I better do some more crunches. Yeah. But there's your front part of your core, there's your side part of your core, and there's the back part of your core. I love doing this thing where I, I lie down on a one of those big blue balls, mm -hmm. you, you know, five foot things that you bounce up and down on, but lie in your tummy and then lift your back up. I love that. It actually doesn't feel like work and it's fun. And that strengthens your back muscles. We all think it's your stomach, but you got to work on your back and then do a side plank. People think, oh, I'm doing a push up. Well, that's great. But do something where you're you know, on your side. And now you've gotten your front core, your side core, your back core. You do your thing going up and down like a flamingo. Now you've got the hip girdle. That all takes about five minutes. Call it a day and feel like you've done what you need to do. And you have. I like that because I've been introducing protocols into my life. Like right now, every day, this is separate from exercise. I do stretching. And then I do 25 burpees and 50 sit-ups. Love it. But I may add the flamingo thing in here because I, I don't want to fall down next time I show you in front of you. And a lot of this is muscle confusion and variety, right? It's like lots of different colors on the plate. And maybe we'll get to that next week in nutrition. And I've been down this road and there's high intensity interval training. There's CrossFit and things like CrossFit, which sort of, try to confuse your body and do all these things that you never thought you would be doing. But I've also been down that route with CrossFit specifically where I'm, I'm the stereotype did CrossFit loved it because they had the time aspect of it, but injured myself because it was so intense. So when you're confusing your body, how intense does this stuff need to be? Start slow. This isn't a sprint. This is a marathon. We talked to people about doing their first marathon. I said the most important goal for you, yeah, finishing is important, but even more so than finishing is that when you cross the finish line, you do not say, I will never do that again. You will be like, no, nah, I want to do another one. If you say, I never will do that again, you ran too fast. Your first marathon will be your personal best. You will set your personal record, no matter what it is. It may be four hours, it may be eight hours. It doesn't really matter. If you don't enjoy it, you ran too fast. 
and walking, run walking. There's lots of strategy around that. So take your time getting to where you need to be. I didn't immediately say, lift your leg up like a flamingo. I said, raise it up two or three inches. And I didn't immediately say, close your eyes. Those are all steps on this path. Start slow, whatever it is, two pounds, three pounds, seven pounds, whatever. Take your time. I think that's the key because we're all at different levels and there's no, I'm ahead of someone else. It's really the whole competition or the growth is only with yourself, right? And that's the hard part of gyms a lot, right? Because you see all these, everybody is amazingly fit except for you. We all think in our head. That's right. And that's dangerous and that's not true and it's not healthy, I would imagine. No. You know, you don't need a fancy personal trainer if you have one. All I would say to the personal trainer is, yeah, I listened to this podcast and you did raise the point that there's some activities I should be thinking about for 10 years from now. Can we do a few exercises to get me there? But, you know, just go on the web on YouTube and say exercises to raise your suitcase into the overhead bin. I'm sure you'll find stuff that will tell you exactly what to do. Exercises to make pickleball better. You know, pickleball is the lateral exercise. You got to move back and forth sideways. I think that's a great thing to do. And love people love doing pickleball. Well, let's talk. Uh, one thing I want to make sure we hit on, and then we can talk about how people begin this journey and just a couple steps they can take. But one thing I wanted to hit on first, Dr. Du Bois, I see I, I'm learning that, is we'll take pickleball as an example or tennis. I've had three knee surgeries. I can't play tennis. I can't handle any lateral. So what does someone do, whether it's tennis or pickleball or some of the things we're talking about when we have are some limitations that prevent us from doing certain things? How do we factor that in there? Well, it's a great question. And we will all have some limitation or other as we age. The good news is that from an aerobic standpoint, if you want to get your heart rate up, there's a lot of different directions to go. I mean, If you're able to run, great. If you're not and your knees hurt, then get on the bike. And if that doesn't work, try an elliptical trainer. Or if your lower half is really just worn out, there are crank machines where basically you do the exercise with your arms and you, you know, sort of do bicycle work like with your arms. There's lots of things on the aerobic side. I think on the strength training and balance, I think there really is no limitation you can't work with. You might need a physical therapist or personal trainer to help you, but you just do what you can do, whether it's an isometric exercise. There's a lot of different things. I I don't think there's a limitation that should keep you working with the muscles you need to. And I think, Bobby, the hard part is, and I've experienced this as I've started to get into yoga, as an example. I use the Peloton app and I do yoga classes and I'm watching Emma Lovewell do, you know, actually Anna Greenberg do yoga and I love Anna. She's awesome, but she's like a fitness model or serious yoga person. But I look at her doing things and then thank God there's not a mirror in my workout area so I can see what I look like in the mirror relative to what she's doing. And this is sort of the point, isn't it? It's not about how bad your downward dog is in in yoga relative to Anna's. It's whatever downward dog you can do at your stage. And it's not bad because it's limited and doesn't look like her. I think that's a big thing. It's the same as the financial situation. My retirement isn't your retirement. Having a million dollars in the bank may be enough for one person, but for another person, it's got to be a lot higher than that. It is specific to who you are and what you want to do. If you want to do a marathon when you're 80, you set a pretty high bar. Great. But that's not necessary if, yeah. you know, if really it's you want to be able to get down on the ground and play sorry, the board game with your grandchild, and then you want to figure out how to get back up again. <laughs> you know, that's, yes. a, that's a different bar that you need to work with. And if you need aids to get you aids, I don't mean a person to pull you back up again. But, you know, if you need a little block to push on to get up or something to pull you up with, that's what you work with. And there is no mirror. It's really just what you want. That's the, I think, a really important lesson when we think about these physical things. We talked about aerobic exercise. We talked about strength. We talked about balance. But there's another piece of this puzzle. That's anaerobic strength. Tell me what that is. When you're a kid and somebody says, oh, we're doing the 100-yard dash. 
you know, it's a different set of muscles than running around the track for 15 minutes. And as we get older, we never do anaerobic exercise. And that is basically short bursts of intense exercise. We don't do that anymore. And that is a problem. And let me give you an example or two about this. You are taking care of your grandchild and you're in the market and you're pushing the cart along and your grandson was holding onto the cart. And that was your way of keeping track of your grandson as you're going to your car in the parking lot. But for whatever reason, sees a squirrel and wants to run after it or a dog or whatever. And you need to, in a burst of speed, run for 10 seconds to catch up with your grandchild or there are cars nearby that you're worried about. That's anaerobic exercise. Or you parked on the fourth floor of the parking garage and the elevator's out. And darn, now I got to walk up four flights of stairs. That's anaerobic. It's a brief burst of intense muscle work. That really deteriorates if you don't think about it. So I would encourage people to do something in the anaerobic zone periodically. If you like to do treadmill for the last minute or two, just go faster, you know, a little bit faster and then maybe more faster. And if it's elliptical trainer that you like to do, do that faster. Or if you're out on a trail and it's not dangerous, then go fast for 10 seconds and see what that feels like. And you might say to yourself, darn, I can do that. Or it may be like, yeah, imagine if I was trying to run after my grandchild. I'm not ready to do that. That deteriorates and it's a silent problem that you won't unearth if you don't try it out on yourself periodically. So I would encourage us to do just a small amount of anaerobic work. I personally hate it, but it's important to do. Uh, Yeah, I do that in cycling and it is hard if you do it right. It's essentially sprinting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I appreciate you bringing that up. And I also appreciate Bobby and I'm actually impressed given your pedigree as a physician, you are always bringing this discussion back to reality. Your grandchild runs away from the cart. These are the things we're trying to solve for. It's not all these fancy physical studies and all the stuff you might read in the health magazines. It's the practical stuff. I appreciate you bringing it back to that because that is the point. That's how you rock retirement, right? Exactly. Exactly. So we've hit on a lot of things people could do. I think it would be helpful very briefly to say, okay, what is the first step regardless of where you're at in this journey to start to incorporate this stuff? I would say two things, which lead to a key third thing. First, do a little bit of envisioning of where you want to be in 10 or 20 or 30 years from a physical standpoint. What do you love doing today that you want to be able to continue to do in the future? Um, Whether it's the 5K, 10K, whether it's the pickleball you want to continue to do, whether it's hiking in the mountains where, you know, it's altitude, whatever it is, just do some envisioning. What would not rocking retirement look like if you couldn't do these things? So that's the first thing. Second, take stock of what you are doing in your exercise regimen, whether it's huge or small, and then connect the dots and say, for the things I want to do, am I doing today activities that will maintain those? And if there's a gap, let's think about how I can plug those gaps. I think I'm doing this pretty well, but God, you made that point about running in a parking lot after my grandchild, I don't think I'm doing anything to preserve that or to even get me there. So maybe I should do something there. So as you like to call with your short sprints, just take stock of what you want the future to be like, take stock of where you are now and begin to plot a path for uh, plugging those gaps if they exist. And if they don't exist and you're doing what you need to do, pat yourself on the back that you're doing the right thing. That's a great planning process. I'm excited to continue this conversation next week. As am I.
This is probably one of my favorite segments of the show, although I love the themes because it helps me refresh my thinking, but we're going to spend some time answering questions from you, the listener, or, you know, one of you anyway, or a few of you, about the journey of figuring out how to rock retirement. Now, if you have a question for the show, go to rogerwhitney.com forward slash ask Roger, and you can submit an audio question or an email question, and we'll work, do our best to slowly keep answering these questions so we can gain perspective on how to rock retirement. Now, our first one comes from Steve, actually, who emailed me after I answered a question on Roth IRAs. And he says, hey, Roger, whenever you talk about Roth IRAs, I almost never see you mention the fact, as I understand it, that you can withdraw your contributions anytime without penalty. Can you clarify this point in your discussions with us? That's a great point, Steve. And after you emailed me that, and I appreciate when I get emails from listeners, usually through our Six Shot Saturday email, because we send out a summary of the show. You can sign up for that at rogerwindy.com. Man, I feel like I'm always saying, hey, go do this. I'm sorry about that. It just makes me think of it. But Steve emailed me after I answered a question on Roth IRAs. I guess, Steve, I probably didn't mention it or don't mention it because I'm always focused on the central question that they're asking. And sometimes I don't get a broader view. So I appreciate you poking me on that one. So when you have a Roth IRA and you make a contribution to it, that contribution dollar you've already paid tax on. So when you go to withdraw money from a Roth IRA, you have all these funky rules of the five-year rule and 59 and a half and all this other stuff. But all the time, you can take out your contribution tax-free. So whether you're 29 and you contribute 5,000 and a year later you want the money back, you can take it back, the 5,000, the contribution amount, because you've already paid tax on that money. And I don't bring that up a lot and I appreciate you helping me clarify that because it's an important nuance of Roth IRA. So thanks, Steve, man. I appreciate that. So our next question comes from Connie about biannual reviews with her financial planner. So Bonnie says, hey, Roger, I'm a regular listener. Enjoy the show. Awesome. I have a financial planner and we meet twice a year. I often do not know what I should be asking him. I am planning to retire him this year and I have the funds I need. What sort of questions should I ask when I meet with him? Well, that's a great question, Connie. And I literally, I just sort of threw this question here. So I hadn't even seen this question other than just a quick glance at it. What should you be asking your financial planner as you work towards retirement? Well, you have a lot of things happening because it sounds like you're ready to retire. So my suggestion, Connie, is the next time that you meet with him or her, you want to ask them, Show me my plan of record for my retirement, which is going to likely be a financial planning software report that shows maybe it's a Monte Carlo report of here's what your goals are, here are the resources from Social Security to maybe pension to all of your investment assets, and here's our confidence that you can achieve this spending at whatever level. And maybe if it's a Monte Carlo scenario, it's going to say, you got a 99% confidence that you can meet these spending goals. So that's the first document that you're going to want to have because that's going to give you a viewpoint of your journey at this point in time and tell you, hey, am I okay? Am I on a safe journey or am I headed towards a cliff that I just can't see over the horizon? So that's the first thing that you're going to ask for. And then have them walk through that and then look at the assumptions. What is my estimated spending, perhaps for my needs, wants, and wishes, and confirm those numbers are accurate? or with it, accurate is to your best estimate at this moment. And a good financial planner will help you create those estimates and dig a layer deep into what your spending is going to be. So as an example, it's easy to say, well, Connie, how much money are you planning on spending in retirement? And Connie says, well, I think I need $120,000 a year. So that's the number that they use. That's a good starting point, but there's a lot of nuance underneath that number that you, the planner should be walking you through. What's behind that $120,000 number? How much is healthcare as part of that? How much of that is your base great life category, which we call needs category, right? What is the housing and just to live the basic life of Connie to make sure you have a roof over your head and you can eat and everything else. Our friends at the IRA and retirement show would call that the minimum dignity floor. 
your planner should be digging deeper on those numbers and then separating out what the discretionary things are. Well, and I've seen this happen in practice, in my practice, many times of someone comes up with a number and we start massaging that number. I'm like, well, where do we get that number? Oh, I got 20,000 in travel that I was thinking of doing. I threw in there. Well, that should be separated. That should be a separate line item because it's much more discretionary. And so you want them to dig deeper on those numbers and separate out the discretionary from the base great life, which is a concept that we used to call needs, which is, you know, some basic travel, some basic education. So you want to have this long-term projection because they should have created one for you as a planner. And two, you want to start to go through the assumptions, look at your spending assumptions. And if they didn't go deeper, you want to go deeper. And that may be an indication that you need to address this or you have the planner do that. You also want to look at the assumptions of what social security will be, assuming you have it, that usually these software tools will generate an assumption based on something you might have filled out on a questionnaire. That's okay to start. But again, the planner should have at some point gone deeper and said, do you have a social security statement? Let me see that. Let me use that number. And if you're retiring at age 52, They might make some adjustment by doing a detailed calculation because the number on your social security statement can be different if you're retiring significantly earlier than your full retirement age. So they should, again, dig into that. Any other social capital pensions and things like that. And then on the financial capital, they should do the same things. Here is each account. Do we have the entire net worth captured? Not just simply your investment accounts, but and I've seen this happen. I'll have a client complete or a potential client complete their financial resources and then at, through discussing it and flushing it out, oh yeah, I have this $100,000 or $300,000 slush fund that I just don't talk about. Well, we, we need to have that in there. Even if we don't include in the plan, we want to know the pieces on the board. So the planner should have done that. And I'll tell you, Connie, one of the hardest things financial planning wise from my perspective is clients open and close accounts, Values go up and down. They pull money without me knowing it. And reconciling to make sure the numbers and the names of the accounts are correct is important. So you want to make sure that they go through that in this biannual meeting as well. And then on other resources, a lot of things that can be forgotten are, oh, I'm going to get an inheritance. I'm going to have this payout. Or I'm planning on selling this house, and but only buying a house worth half the amount, so the rest of the money's coming in. So you want to make sure all this is in the plan of record. If it's not, that means they may not have gone d- deep enough. So this would be a good agenda, say, for this next semi-annual meeting. And then look at the analysis of whether it says it's okay or not. Now, the other thing that you should ask, Connie, especially if you're close to retirement, and it says, I think it's this year you said, And this is where financial planning software generally falls apart. So in my practice, we use software for all of this discussion as a long-term projection. So in this next meeting, and this is something you want to review every meeting, is, okay, how am I actually going to do this? And what we use in our practice is a a five- to eight-year cash flow projection, outlining all of the income and the spending that we see and the deciding how we're going to pay for this when the income goes away and what specific account is that money going to come from? And that's the pie cake structure. And we have, we'll put a link to it. Uh, Hey, Nicole, she's the one that drafts six shot Saturday. We'll put a link to a discussion of what that pie cake is. I think it would be helpful to you, Connie. I think it'd be critical for you, Connie, that if you're retiring within a year, you want to know how the next five years of your life is going to be paid for specifically once you quit your job or once you retire. And that money should be de-risked and set aside so it's not at the whim of stock markets or bond funds going down because interest rates are going down. That's the money for the first five years of your life in retirement that you're not worried about the return on your money in terms of an investment return or interest. You're worried about the return of your money. Because that's going to give you a lot of confidence that, okay, even if the world goes sideways, I'm going to feel it, but I'm going to handle it because I got this mapped out. I got a lot of slack in the system. So these are the things that you want to go over pretty much every time you have a meeting with your planner. And if you have a 
evolve or good planner, they should be doing this automatically and digging deeper. What's changed, Connie? Let's review this. Is this still where we want to go and changing those goals as you iterate on this semi-annual cycle that you're on? And then lastly, Connie, this would be my suggestion, is towards the end of the meeting, you and your planner should identify risks or opportunities that you want to focus on. It could be simply reviewing the tax return. It could be recalculating your income floor, the money you're going to have spending. It could be redoing the assumptions. But you want to get specific on what can we do next and who does it and then agree on that action item. That's critical. Ideally, you would have an action item. They would have an action item. And then the last thing is don't leave the meeting without the next meeting scheduled. Don't wait for them to send you a calendar link or for somebody from the office to call you. Schedule the meeting with them if you're able at the end of that meeting. Both of you put it on your calendar, have the invites. Yeah, the meeting might change because it's six months down the road in your case and you're not sure, but you have it set. You have your action items. And in between, you may share emails or have a random phone call to work on those action items. So that would be my suggestion of what you would do on a bi-yearly, is it bi-yearly, bi-annual? I always get those mixed up. Every six months. If you don't have an agenda like that, in my experience, what ends up happening is it becomes very surface. Yeah, this is what we saw in the markets. Here's how your investments did. You still have 99% confidence, according to our fancy model. How How is the family? And it becomes surface check-in without specific actions being done. And if you want to be agile, knowing that all this stuff changes, what ends up will happen is you'll leave a meeting. No, oh, they're such a nice person. And then you have no more clarity on how this is actually going to work. And you don't have any agency, anything that you can do to help row the boat to make it happen. You just feel like you're at the whim of whatever. And we talked about this in the fundamental series we did a few months ago. It's critical that you have three things. One is you have an inspiring goal for a future state for yourself, a better life of some sort. That's the human condition. We always want to have that. Two, you got to have agency that I have my hand on the oars and I'm rowing. I'm doing my part to work towards this better state for my life or to be able to travel or whatever else. You have to have agency and not just simply trust somebody else to say, oh, it's okay, don't worry. And the last thing, you have to have pathways of what should I be doing with my agency? And that's the things that you want to maintain and create in these meetings. Wow, I felt like I went off for a while on that, Connie, but I think that's important. Let's see if we can get to one more question. This will only be the second question, and I'm sorry about that. We have a long conversation with Bobby because it's so good, but we'll keep getting questions because I want to Focus on your questions and make sure we get them answered. And I think, Connie, your question, I think, applies to so many people that are working with planners or advisors. And I think, it's my own personal feeling, that the bar is set much too low on what they should be doing. It shouldn't be relational. I think it's fine to pay a fee, but you want to make sure that there's a project management orientation to this because that's going to empower you. All right, let's get to another question. This one is from Nancy. Nancy says, hey, Roger, I wondered what you thought about closed-end mutual funds. I read an article that advocated putting a good amount of your retirement savings into closed-end funds to generate large dividend payments and interest payments that could help fund your retirement. Then I read that you can't sell them back to the company, but only on the open market like a stock. Can you talk about the pros and cons of open-end mutual funds? Thanks for the great education and podcast. I look forward to listening. Great question, Nancy, and very timely. I probably should have answered this maybe six months ago, and you'll realize why in a moment. So let's first talk about the structure. What is a closed-end mutual fund? So you have three types of mutual funds that we generally talk about. We have the open-end mutual funds, which are the ones that have a symbol of letters that are five letters. And generally, that's what you're going to have in your 401k, and likely you have them in investment accounts. And the way those work are that when you buy a share of the mutual fund, 
the fund company issues the share of stock to you at the net asset value, assuming there's no sales load on the front end, which is the value of the portfolio at that time. And then you own that share of the portfolio. And then when you want to sell your share on an open-end mutual fund structure, you sell that share directly back to the fund company and they pay you the net asset value of the value of that portfolio at that time. And so they're constantly issue and taking back shares based on people buying shares and selling shares. So that's an open-end mutual fund. And you're buying a, it's like a limited partnership. You're buying a portion of a larger portfolio that's managed independently of you. So it has, they don't buy new stocks necessarily when you own it. You're just buying into whatever the portfolio is. Second type is more recent type, a very popular one right now, which is called an exchange traded mutual fund. So that's going to be traded on the stock exchange, the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange, et cetera. And with an exchange traded fund, it's a fancy, relatively new structure where when you buy a share, you're buying it from the fund company, but there's this fancy mechanism worked out that you're buying the shares, it's really hard to explain without getting too complicated, but when you buy a share of an exchange traded fund, you're essentially buying new shares of all the things in the portfolio. So you're not buying, say, if it owns Apple stock, you're going to own Apple stock at that price of Apple stock that day within the portfolio, rather than the Apple stock that was, say, bought 20 years ago that has all these gains built into it. So there's this crazy complicated mechanism of clearing, but you can do it intraday rather than once a day, which is what an open-end mutual fund. So that's pretty transparent. And there's a lot of advantages to exchange-traded funds. One is that they're typically very tax-efficient relative to open-end mutual funds. We don't need to get into that here. Two is that you can always see exactly what's in the portfolio because it's very transparent that way. And three is that you can buy it in a day. So you can trade it just like a stock. And typically, it tracks very closely to the portfolio because of the technology behind it. Okay, let's put that rabbit hole away. To your question, Nancy, what about closed-end mutual funds? A closed-end mutual fund has been around for a long time. And the way a closed-end mutual fund works is, again, an investment manager, just, you know, Vanguard, name them. I don't know if Vanguard has any, but name whatever investment manager you want, what they do is they issue shares of a fund like a stock. So like an ETF, it trades on the stock exchange and you can buy it intraday, but they only issue so many shares. And so they don't buy and redeem shares based on people buying or selling the closed end mutual fund. If they got a million shares, there's just a million shares out there. And the value of the shares is determined by the price of those shares on a stock exchange. And there's no reconciliation to match what the actual value of the portfolio is within it. And so with a closed-end fund, when you buy one, say at $10, it could trade, be trading at a premium or a discount to the actual value of the security. So let's say you have 100 stocks and the total value of the portfolio of a closed-end fund is worth $9 a share. It could be selling for $10 a share. So you're buying it at a premium relative to the actual value if you were to sell every stock and give people their money. So closed-end funds, because they don't issue and redeem shares actively, they can trade at a premium to the actual value of the portfolio or at a discount to the actual value of the portfolio. And that's neither good or bad necessarily. But to your specific question, Nancy, now that I've rambled on a lot about fund structures, sorry about that is typically, or traditionally with closed-end funds, Nancy, they were issued either to own bonds or dividend-paying stocks and to throw off a lot of income. And you can find closed-end funds that throw off a lot more income than you might be able to buy if you actually went and bought the stocks. So let me, let me actually pull up an example here. This might be a good way to explain it. So let's look at an example of a closed-end mutual fund to talk about some of the dynamics of a typical one that I see. Now, they these come in all flavors, so I don't want to make a broad generalization. But when Nancy, when we're talking about buying these for income, a lot of these are designed to throw off a lot of income, but they do certain things to do that. Okay, so let's look at an example. We're going to look at a symbol, 
David Frank Paul, DFP, which is the Flaherty and Coomrine Dynamic Preferred Income and Incorporated. All right. Now, as a disclaimer, all these investments have risks and fees. There's a lot of consideration to go into this. We're just going to use this as a teaching example. I have never seen this fund before. Don't know anything about the firm that manages it. I just went to two different websites, Morningstar and another, to just look at the attributes of this fund. So just want to use it as an example. You get the point. Talk to your legal, financial, tax advisor for making your own decisions. Okay. Now with all that out of the way, we'll look at this fund. Looks like it was established in May of 2013. So this thing's been around a long time. And it would trade on, I believe, the New York Stock Exchange or one of the major exchanges. So you would see this like a stock. Oh, wow. DFP, it has a current yield, according to the site, of 8.21%. So if you buy this fund, you're going to get a current yield of 8.21% on whatever dollar you put into it. That's pretty attractive right now, isn't it? So you imagine buying this one maybe and a bunch of others, you're going to have a lot of yield being thrown back to you with a, these income-focused closed-end mutual funds. That's pretty attractive. Hmm, interesting. But when you look at it, like just pull it up, all you're going to see is the symbol and the yield and say, wow, that's pretty cool. And you're buying an instant portfolio of this. I'm assuming it's preferred stocks of some sort. That sounds sort of cool because those are meant for income. And so is that good or not to buy for you, Nancy? I don't know. But let's look a little bit deeper at this particular closed-end fund as an example. It has fees of just over 2%. Okay, that seems a little high. But hey, it's thrown off to, you know, it's been around forever. It's thrown off over 8% current yield, according to this site. Um, what do I care what I'm paying as long as I'm getting my income? The key thing, though, you want to look at, Nancy, when you're looking at buying a couple things. One is you want to look at the leverage that they're using to create that yield because this isn't as readily apparent. So in the case of this fund, according to the site I'm looking at, it uses roughly one and a half percent leverage. So what does that mean? So it means if there's a hundred million dollars in this fund, they're borrowing money with the value of the fund as collateral to buy. So if you have $100 million in this fund, they're buying roughly $150 million of securities. So they're using margin. They're borrowing money in order to have more securities that are paying high income. That is a major reason why they're able to pay out, say in this case, 8.21% current yield. So when you buy something like this, typically, you're buying a leveraged portfolio, which means when you leverage money and the price of the underlying asset goes up and down, you're going to have bigger swings in volatility because you, for every dollar you put in, they're buying a dollar fifty worth of assets. So as an equivalent, and again, I'm just looking on this page, so no endorsements, et cetera. If you look at symbol PFF, which is the iShares Preferred Income Fund, and they use no leverage, Meaning if you put a dollar in, they're only buying a dollar securities and their fees are a lot less. Their current yield, according to the site on this day, is 4.94%, significantly lower than the first one we talked about, primarily because of two reasons. One is they're not using leverage and two is they have lower fees. So that's the first thing we want to understand about these things, Nancy. The second thing we want to understand about is understanding the underlying security which is, in this case, preferred stocks. Now, preferred stocks seem safe, right? It, traditionally, a preferred stock is a stock that a company would issue that had preferential treatment on the cash flows of the company that was buying. So if XYZ company paid a dividend to its normal stockholders, it would first have to pay the dividend to the preferred stockholder. So it's higher up in the asset structure of the corporation, traditionally. About 20 years ago, preferred stocks changed in structure. Now, it's not always this way, but a new structure of preferred stock came around, and I believe it was the eight, late 90s, and I feel old because I'm like, I was there. I remember all this happening. And the modern preferred stock that I see more often is, it's called a preferred stock, but really what it is, it's like a trust that the company will create. 
And then it will issue bonds, long-term bonds, 30-year plus bonds typically, to the trust. And then the trust would issue the preferred stock. So it's not actually your grandma's old school preferred stock. So the reason I bring this up, Nancy, when you're navigating this closed-end mutual fund world is that how does a long-term bond act even though it has the name of a preferred stock? Well, if interest rates go up, it can go down more quickly than a shorter-term bond fund. So when you buy a modern preferred stock, it's going to act in terms of volatility moving up and down much more like a long-term bond than grandma's old school preferred stock. That's important to know. And then if you put it into a closed-end mutual fund and you add leverage, say I buy $1.50 for every dollar I have of these very long-term bonds so I can have this amazing dividend That can be really good when interest rates are going down. These things can actually appreciate very quickly. But flip side, when interest rates are going up, these things, which are generally very sleepy, can lose a lot of money really quickly. And so I guess my, I should have done this at the beginning, Nancy. Sorry. But I think through this out loud, and I think it's helpful to understand some of this. Closed-end mutual funds, especially ones that focus on income, can be very manufactured and not be quite what they seem on the surface. And so we want to be very careful there. Now, if interest rates go up and the price of this goes down significantly because they can have wild swings, especially if they're using leverage, unless something changes internally, you should still get the same dollar amount payment over time, depending on the portfolio. But you could see the price value of it have very significant swings. So when interest rates are high and you think interest rates are going to go down, this is actually a levered way. You buy a closed-end mutual funds, interest rates go down, you're probably going to have pretty good price appreciation. But conversely, if interest rates go up, you're going to have the opposite. So I would be very careful with these as a strategy. Back in the quote-unquote day, I would use these periodically more as a trade on a directional bet that also throws off income. Over the last five, 10 years, I don't use them at all. Actually, the the last time I used them was right around 08, when a lot of these levered things really got hammered. It was just from a tactical playing around standpoint, an easy way to, not an easy way, but a way to play that, hey, things will revert back and get okay. So Nancy, I think as a general rule, I would be very cautious and possibly avoid closed-end mutual funds unless they are very clean. They're not using leverage. You understand what's in them. From that perspective, I think they can possibly have a fit, but I like to keep things simple. And in this age of really trying to get yield, it's easy to go down some rabbit holes that might not be that healthy. So hopefully that answered. I'm sorry if I gave you way too much information, than more information than you want. With that, let's go set a smart sprint. On your marks, get set. And we're off to set a little baby step you can take in the next seven days to not just rock retirement, but rock your life. Uh, oh, I felt like I just been a little bit on a roll today. Hopefully it was focused enough for you. All right. What can you do over the next seven days? Well, I think taking Bobby's suggestion and taking inventory of your exercise regimen and what you're doing and what you want to be doing is a great three-step process that you should evaluate for yourself over the next week or so. And just make one little change. I think that's the key thing here. You may say, oh, I got to overhaul everything based on a great conversation with Bobby. Don't do that. I wouldn't suggest doing that. Just start to implement little things at a time and you'll be on your way to physically rocking retirement. All right. This is a long show today, so why don't you get off and, well, rock today, okay? Mm. 
Hey, it's time for that all important disclaimer. We so appreciate you listening to the show and love your questions and love the teaching that we're able to provide here. And actually it helps us too, but remember you're not our clients. Not love it. If you took advice from yeah, us, on we, the would show. Not, we would not love it. If you took advice from us on the show, realize this is helpful in an education, talk to your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor before you make any decisions. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of Retirement Answer Man. Be sure to visit rogerwhitney.com slash answers to access the Retirement Answer Library with over 30 checklists to help you make the most of the only life you have. Remember, you have more power than you realize to create an amazing life starting today with Retirement Answer Man. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Have a wonderful day.